This is Sahih al-Bukhari. Can you imagine the amount of knowledge you'd have if you read it cover to cover? Well, there's no need to imagine anymore because you'll get none or very little at the most. Why? Well, before I tell you why you won't gain any knowledge, first we need to discuss why you're reading it in the first place. You're reading this book to know most of the ahadith that the Prophet wasallam spoke so you can become more knowledgeable regarding Islamic rulings, right? Let's say you memorize, not even read, memorize Sahih Muslim 2 and Sunan Abu Dawood and Jama' and Tirmidhi and Musnad Ahmed, all of them. You're the man now, right? Wrong. Forget the thousands of a hadith, let's just take one. You have this hadith and you want to use it as evidence for music being haram. Before you can do that, the scholars have put certain questions in place and only after you know their answers do you have the right to put forth a hadith as evidence to an Islamic ruling. Question one, is the hadith acceptable? Which means, is it hasan or sahih? And who deemed it hasan or deemed it sahih? Or is it a weak hadith? If it is, then have the conditions of the acceptable weak hadith been satisfied? What are those conditions you may ask? Exactly, that's why they're the scholars. Question two, is the hadith mansukh or ghair mansukh? Which means, is the hadith abrogated or non-abrogated? Abrogated means cancelled ruling. Question three, is it sunnah qawliya or is it sunnah fa'liya? And if it is a sunnah fa'liya, then of which kind of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him's actions is it? Which category does it fall under? Question four, is the hadith mutawa Water, which means an overwhelming number of narrators have come forth with this hadith, making it virtually impossible for all of them to agree on a lie. Or is it khabaru ahad, which means it's not mutawatir. Question five, is the hadith insha, meaning it's bringing about a matter, or is it khabar, meaning it's informing? And if it is insha, then is it an amr, meaning it's commanding, or is it a nahi, meaning it's forbidding? And if it is an amr, then has it been categorized as wujub? meaning it's an obligation, or as nedb, meaning it's a recommendation. Or if it is nahi, then has it been categorized as haram, which means it's obviously impermissible, or as makruh, which means it's reprehensible. Question six, is the hadith used as evidence through the mantuq or the mafhum? And if it is mantuq, then is it sarih or ghair sarih? If it's sarih, then is it nas or zahir or mujmal? But if it's not sarih, then is it iqtida'un or ima'un or ishara? However, if it is through the mafhum, then is it mafhumu muwafaqa or is it mafhumu mukhalifa? If it's mafhumu muwafaqa, then is it from fahwa al-khitab or lahn al-khitab? Or if it's from mafhumu mukhalifa, then is it from mafhum al-sifati or al-sharti or al-ghayati or al-adad? Yeah, I know, and we're not even done yet. Question seven, is there a majaz in the hadith? If there is, is it majaz aqli or lughawi? And is the lughawi mursalun or isti'ara? And what is the alaqa and qarana in every type? Question Question 8. Is the hadith general? And if it is general, then does it have a mukhassas? If it does, then is it mukhassas muttasal or munfasal? Question 9. Is the hadith mutlaq? If it is, then does it have a muqayyid? And finally, question 10. Did the hadith contradict another? And if it did, then how will you combine between them? And if combining between them is not possible, then how will you balance between them? Will you do it based on al-sanad or al-matin or al-madlul or an external matter. Now I don't know about you guys but I'd only ever occasionally be able to answer whether it's sahih or hasan. And that's not a shortcoming. Al-Haqq subhanahu wa ta'ala says and the ulama have used this as evidence to the statement that the scholars of Islam should be a group of the Muslims, not all of them. You see, you're either capable of extrapolation or you're not. If you choose to take the road of scholarship, then away you go to study the Islamic sciences under the scholars who have an unbroken chain of scholarly transmission tracing back to the Prophet but if you choose not to, then we can't be walking around trying to do their job. But this is not the same as us transmitting what they are saying. Ibn Wahab, who is one of Imam Malik's greatest students, essentially one of Imam Shafi's classmates, and undoubtedly amongst Salaf al Salih, he said, Kullu 
Allah. And some might say, you know what? Fine, I'll read the hadith explanation books and then I'll be capable. Ah, slow down there. In his explanation of Sahih Muslim, Al Imam Al Nawi Rahimahullah spoke about a fiqh book he contributed to called Al Majmu'i fi Sharh al Muhadhab. He said, in that fiqh book, I presented and spoke about the evidence on certain issues, the differences between the madhahib, and all the pieces of evidence that is differed upon. And he says, Meaning he went above and beyond in the explanation and presentation of these things in that fiqh book. But regarding this year book, Sharh Sahih Muslim, ليس مرادي هنا إلا الإشارة إلى ما يتعلق بالحديث. But my intention here in Sahih Muslim and its explanation is only to talk about what is related to the hadith itself, not the entire ruling. This is to show you that it's not as simple as hadith equals ruling. So much goes into it, yet some people still tell me, nah bro, it's clear, just read it. Oh, thank God, bro, thank you. I guess the scholars from the first three generations got it wrong and you got it right. Now, here's a matter that the four schools differed upon just to drive the point home. We have this hadith and I want you to focus on this part right here. al mutanammisat refers to the women who pluck their eyebrows and the act itself is called in nams. A non-scholar would read this and say, well, okay, then plucking the eyebrows is a giant sin. Here's what the four schools arrive to. The Hanafi school says, if she has done it to beautify herself for other than her husband, or if she has done it to hurt herself, then it is haram. The Maliki school says, it is haram for the woman who has been forbidden to use her adornment, i.e. the one whose husband has died or has gone missing. The Shafi'i school says, it's permissible if her husband has allowed her to do it. The Hanbali school says, it's haram, with a minority saying it's makroh. It's not about what you know, it's about what you don't. And speaking of knowing, don't forget, there's always more to know. So say, Rabbi zidni ilma, and as usual, the protection of Allah. Take care. Thank you.